Um, so first we want to say hi and um, welcome to our webinar on responding to the coronavirus, um, a faculty triage guide for decision making. Um, this morning at 5 a.m. when Heather and I were chatting about this session, um, I got to thinking about how when you plan a party and at first how one person shows up and then you're a little bummed out because only one person has shown up, but then a few more people show up. And then you start to wonder, are you gonna run out of snacks? Um, and so I'm really pleased to see that so many people have shown up for our party and, um, and we haven't run out of snacks yet. Um, so uh, we thought we would start out this session with a quote from um, Rebecca Barrett Fox's blog post. A lot of you probably have seen the blog post and all of these links will be shared in a Google Doc with the group. Um, her post was called, please do a bad job of putting your course online. You're not building an online class. You're not teaching students who can be expected to be ready to learn online. And most importantly, your class is not the highest priority of their or your life right now. Release yourself from high expectations right now, because that's the best way to help your students learn. Okay, so your presenters today, um, I am Ann Fancy, and I myself am transitioning a live class to a remote uh, learning class next week. I met with them for the final time on Friday as we said our teary goodbyes, and we're on spring break this week, and we will meet um, together uh, virtually next week. And if you're interested in finding out how I made decisions about that, I'm happy to share. Um, I have also supported many faculty in their transition to teaching in distance education when I was an instructional designer in the University of Maine system. Um, right now, I am a full-time doctoral student in higher education studying instruction in distance education. And as a parent of children with physical uh, mental and emotional disabilities. I also have experience with being flexible in a crisis. Um, and um, our other presenter this morning is Heather Nunez Olmsted. Hello, my name's Heather, um, Heather Nunez Olmsted, and I'm an instructional design specialist with the Center for Teaching and Learning at University of Maine Presque Isle. Um, and I'm also currently teaching an undergraduate class in educational technology um, in the classroom that I'm having to switch from being face-to-face -to, -face to online. And the irony of it is when we first started getting all of these, the influx in news and on the West Coast schools talking about shutting down, I kind of brought that to my students because it's educational technology and that'll affect a lot of what they're doing and talked about, well, what if we have weather or flood? I mean, we live in Northern Maine, we have weather a lot. How would we handle digital learning days? So they felt really prepared to make the shift a week and a half later when all of a sudden our our University of Maine system announced that we're going to be sh shifting to online. And Ashley. Hi, uh, Ashley Montgomery. I'm the Assistant Dean of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment at UMF, University of Maine at Farmington. And I'm currently teaching an online graduate class in education. Um, so that, that isn't a shift for me, but there is going to be a shift in my curriculum because I've kind of put my class on pause right now given that the majority of my students in the class are work in the field of education. Um, and so I wanna give them some time to figure out what they're doing you know, in their lives outside of being grad students. Um, we also just finished reading and discussing Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. So I'm thinking about how these events uh, might recast their final assignments, and in general, how I see my class finishing the term. Um, the other part of my work is that I support faculty teaching online and otherwise at my institution. So we thought we would begin by checking in uh, with you. So if you are joining us live, uh, because this will also be recorded, uh, your Zoom window kind of looks something like this. And down at the bottom, you will see some buttons and you're looking for a button that says chat. So when you click on that chat button, a window will open over to the side and there's a box at the bottom for you to type in your message to the group. So I'm not assuming anyone knows how to use Zoom right now. Um, so uh, that's some, something to model that we're scaffolding that. And I'd like you to type into the chat a word or a phrase that describes how you are feeling right now.
Now we will also post the transcript um, when we post the recording, but um, Heather, can you tell us some of what people are saying? Um, people who watch the recording will not see the screen, but um, they'll be able to read some of this in a separate document. So yeah, we have a lot along a theme of some anxiety and anxiousness, um, feeling some pressure about time. Um, ooh, somebody, William said optimistic and Kristen also said hopeful. So we like hearing that. Um, being proud about the um, collaboration of, of the teamwork, feeling nervous about shifting and a little bit of overwhelm, but getting better. There's a lot of resources out there now, so. Great. So hopefully we can allay some of those anxiety uh, feelings and some of you who are optimistic can share that with the rest of us. Um, that's a hot commodity right now. <laughs> um, so Heather, can you explain what we mean by faculty triage for decision-making? So yeah, definitely. Um, so I just wanna throw out there, I'm married to a nurse, so it would, I would, get in trouble at home if I did not point out that we're not medical providers here. So do not use any information from this presentation to try to save anybody's life, please. Um, when we talk about the triage models and emergency in medicine, of course, we're talking about the goal of prioritizing, um, deciding what needs need treatment first so that we can continue um, on. And usually the first thing they check for um, is whether you can move, whether you can breathe, Oxygen is super essential, right? Because we need oxygen in our brain to stay alive. Um, next, I'll check your pulse and make sure that circulation is running okay. And then they check on your mental emotional state. So Ashley, how can we use this to help us in a crisis academically? Um, in this case, we're not trying to decide who to treat first, but we can use that metaphor to help us decide where we should focus on first and help us make decisions. Um, in this presentation, we will talk about finding out what is your oxygen? What are the essential things you need to assess and plan for? What is your heart? Or what is most meaningful to you about your course? And finally, we'll talk about the mind or the actual teaching and learning that you want to try to accomplish in the remainder of the semester. Uh, you know, Ashley, some people wonder whether learning can actually happen in a crisis situation. And many of us have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which says that basic safety needs need to be met before we can reach higher levels of functioning like learning. So let's see what other thinks, uh, others think about this by using the poll tool. So I am going to launch a poll and you will see a poll come up on your screen with a question that says, do you think it's possible for students to continue to learn anything meaningful in your course during the rest of the semester, given the change, changes to your course and everything else they will be dealing with? And for those who are watching the recording, uh, we will um, post the results too, but we'll give you a couple minutes to um, submit your answer. The choices, answer choices are one, heck yeah, this is a teachable moment. Two, probably if things are done well. Three, I'm not sure. Four, very unlikely. And five, Magic 8-Ball says, my sources say no. So I'll leave that for just another moment and then we'll share the results here. All right, so I'm gonna share these results on the screen and we're looking pretty optimistic. So we've got 39% of us saying, heck yeah, this is a teachable moment. And 50% of us saying probably if things are done well, and that's what we're hoping to help you with today. And just a couple of people, not sure. Um, and that's very promising to see that um, people think that it's possible for some li um, learning to happen here. So let's take Maslow with a bit of caution. So first of all, uh, Abraham Maslow only included the healthiest 1% of college students in his study populations. And other psychologists have suggested that there might be some cultural bias in his model. 
Um, so indicators of life satisfaction are sometimes lower in developed Western countries um, that have their basic needs met. Um, and sometimes they're higher in underdeveloped countries where they don't have their basic needs met as well. So while our physiological and safety needs are important, I like to think of this pyramid as representing how demanding each of these areas can be on our psyche, rather than a checklist for what needs to be met before moving on to the next level. So for example, if any of these basic needs are not being met, and that is going to be the case with some people, they are going to take up a lot of their mental space and energy, which makes it harder for learning to happen, but not impossible. It's important for us to understand that our learners may be experiencing some challenges with meeting their basic needs, and we need to remain flexible with what they can contribute to the learning experience. However, we can contribute to some normalcy to an unsettling time by continuing on with our courses and providing some familiar routine uh, during some potential chaos. And Ashley shared with me a very helpful article from the uh, Vanderbilt University Center for Teaching uh, called Teaching in Times of Crisis. And Ashley, can you put a link to that article in the chat and tell us about it? Sure. Um, so there's a link to the article. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Vanderbilt Center for Teaching. Um, I really look at it as someone who runs a teaching and learning center as one of my sort of uh, really go-to resources. Um, this article was originally written in 2001 as a response to 9-11, but has been updated periodically over the years um, to sort of help be a resource for these times of crisis. Um, and it really highlights four key areas. And the first being um, to mind the cognitive load of your students. You know, they are, um, they're dealing with a lot right now. And so thinking about our expectations, this is an opportunity for us to, um, you know, to really think about how can we reframe what we're doing in a way so that we can all get through this experience as best we can. Um, the second key area is assigning relevant activities or materials. Um, so this, the way I've talked about this to faculty as of late is you may consider how you use the lens of your discipline to look at events or topics related to the pandemic and how it connects to your discipline. Um, facilitating a discussion um, is another key area. And this is not necessarily a discussion about the content, but a venue for students to talk about the crisis, to talk about um, where they're at and how they're feeling. Um, and then last, uh, providing resources for them. Um, Students appreciate it when we address the realities of what's going on right now uh, that's impacting us all. Thanks, Ashley. That, that is a good article. Um, so going back to Maslow, though, I don't think we're able to tell what our students' basic needs are um, in terms of like physiological and safety needs. So what basic needs should we consider in this transition? So I think the chief among those is sort of looking at their basic needs, whether it's safety, shelter, or food, or a combination of those. Um, we're not equipped to assist students in many of these areas, but we can certainly let our students know that we care about them and for them any resources that we come across. I know for many states, services like 211 is a fabulous resource to help students or anyone connect to things they might need to address their basic needs. Um, there's some things that we definitely need to check in with our students about. Um, and so I've shared a screenshot of a survey that has been, I actually don't know the original source for it. It may be somebody on this call um, that went around the teaching and learning circles. It was an, a, a widely shared Google survey. Um, and it's a way for us to sort of check in with our students and see, do they have access to a device? Would they, um, what kind of device is it? Do they have internet access? Are they on a mobile device? Um, what is their Wi-Fi like? Um, of the, their access, how good is the bandwidth? You know, um, we live, I live in a very rural area and there are bandwidth considerations for where I'm at as compared to someone who may be in a more urban environment or somebody who's sitting outside of Dunkin' Donuts to use the free Wi-Fi. Um, so it's important, I think, to find these pieces out. Um, 
Another important consideration for you is if you have any students that require an accommodation or have a disability. Um, most of those students have likely been ident have identified themselves to you through your campus disability services office, but some may not have because the modality that they were in didn't make it necessary. Now that they will be completing their classes remotely, their dis disability may become more pertinent. So some students may become temporarily disabled by becoming ill or caring for an ill family member. Um, now that many public schools are closing, this may compli complicate the needs for students who are parents and other students may find themselves out of work or needing to work more. So I would encourage students to connect with you um, with any specific needs as soon as possible um, and so that you can adjust what you're doing and accommodate them. Um, I've made a copy of this survey and um, that you can use. It's got some really great questions. I do ask that you um, sort of follow the guidelines on the image where you click on the dot, dot, dot in the upper corner and make a copy. Um, otherwise, if you send this survey out as it is to your students, then I'm going to get all their information. And can you share that link in the chat? Oh, I just posted that, Ashley. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, so actually I like the fact that you mentioned kind of managing, you know, all the potential emails that could come your way. Cause I think one of the really important things that we have to keep um, our pulse on as we move forward into um, digital learning spaces is many of us, most of us almost I'd be willing to put out there are not IT staff or not trained usually as support staff and so i think it's really important for us to recognize and name and write down who our major supports are and those supports could be the it help desk um, for student connection issues or a variety of things they could be the instructional design or center for teaching and learning departments on your individual campus um, they could be potentially human resources um, there's a lot of social media out there right now specifically devoted to this very topic. Um, it can seem like an overload, but I've found it helpful just personally in my own kind of search to look at what are the actual needs that I have? Like, am I looking for how to make effective online discussions and let those kind of inform as you're looking through the hashtags, um, you know, being really specific about what you're searching for because there is a lot of awesome information out there right now. And also the pod network, which is the professional and, professional and organizational development. Um, they actually have a Google group that I'm going to post in the chat really quickly. And they have lots of good resources there as well. Um, when we were talking about this yesterday, um, Ashley actually mentioned that she has a really strong and a great strategy for peer to peer support, which I thought was really innovative and great to where they've identified you know, specific people that have strengths on their campuses um, and they're able to share that. But I'll go ahead and let Ashley you know, go over that, that structure because it's really great. So I am a center of one. Um, so it's me and the faculty here at UMF. And so one of the first things that came to mind was, well, I'm just gonna sit down with everybody and you know, go over anything they need and it's all gonna be okay. And then I got to thinking about how many hours there are in the day between now and next week. And I thought, that's not probably feasible. I don't think that math actually works. Um, so I reached out to the campus with just a quick Google form and asked, um, you know, what tools are you most comfortable with? If you're somebody, you know, who's maybe taught online before or who uses a lot of technology as part of their teaching, you know, what tools are you comfortable with? Um, what tools would you be comfortable, you know, showing to a colleague um, or helping them troubleshoot? Um, and then what format would you prefer to help somebody in? Um, and so I gave you a little screenshot here. I did black out people's names so you don't go emailing some of these people. But folks really, I mean, it's now up to about 20 people. This is, there's about 10 on here when I took the screenshot last night. Um, that have all these different areas that they're available to help their colleagues in. So I'm maintaining this as sort of a live sheet um, that I'm share, gonna share with campus of folks that can, in addition to me helping them, can help them um, figure out some of these options as well. 
So we're also uh, going to crowdsource with you too. Um, so we have developed a handout um, for this session. Um, and Heather, if you could post that handout in the chat, that would be great. And so we've included some of the uh, talking points in our presentation here. But we would also like you to add your own um, resources on there too. Um, so there are lots of really great things going around online and it can be hard to curate those. So you can use this document um, that we're building together here to help you keep track of all of that. So now let's talk about our triage and uh, let's think about oxygen. So I want you to type into the chat, what is your oxygen? What's the most critical thing to you in your class right now? Keeping fragile students engaged, being uh, well-being and comfort, calming, caring, connecting. Keeping students. I don't know if that was a complete sentence. So just actually keeping your students. I think that is a great uh, uh, thing to be focused on too. Um, staying healthy, momentum, checking in with students seeing if they're ready, being able to make learning different, um, but still successful, making sure students are okay, making them feel belonged and included. Great, so we think that there are um, three essential elements in this oxygen molecule. Um, I know that in the science land, it only has two um, elements in the molecule, but um, we're going to put three in here just because um, we can do that. Uh, so first is, is connection. Staying connected to your students is going to be critical for managing logistics, providing information, and taking the pulse of your learners. Connection is also going to be important in combating the isolation that can come with distance learning. The next element is continuity. So you won't be able to replicate your class online, but there are some things you can do to carry on and provide some comforting routines. Continuity is also important in reducing anxiety in your learners so they know what to expect. And the final element is care. If your students don't know yet that you care about them and their success, there is no better time than now to let them know. Make this explicit in your communications, especially in this period of uncertainty and worry to help ease your students' anxieties. So these three elements are going to be essential in your transition to remote instruction and will be helpful as you make your instructional decisions. So let's dig into them a little bit deeper. Um, and Heather will tell us about why connections are so important and how to develop and maintain them while you no longer see your students in person. So one of the first steps in connection, of course, is the communication piece. Um, if you haven't already connected with your students about shifting to, or the possibility in some cases of shifting to distance learning, you should probably do so right now. Well, maybe wait until we're done talking right now um, so that you don't have to multitask, but there's no time like the present to reach out to students and let them know um, that you're developing a plan, that you realize that they may be anxious, and just to create that personal connection with students. So if you are at a school like the UMaine system where we've already decided to suspend in-person classes after break, um, we have a little email model here that we can kind of walk you through. And this is just an example. And of course, you're going to personalize it and add all the love that you would normally um, give to students anyway. But let's just kind of walk through the major parts of our example here. So we can see that it starts off with my dear students, a warm welcome, right? And then it immediately kicks into, you may have heard that we're transitioning to online, which is kind of addressing the elephant in the room, right? So we're gonna kick off saying, okay, we know that this change is coming and I recognize that it's a change. This does a good job at showing empathy and letting students know that you realize that it's actually a disruption to them. So after that, we have, um, we have some information on, okay, we're in this together, and then some basic goals where we're going to have, we're not going to have class the way we thought we would, but here's, you know, something that we may be doing instead. So 
I don't think any students really expect you to have your entire semester plan mapped out in this initial touch base email. Um, the most important thing is letting students know just what to expect while you're still planning. So how can they expect to hear from you? How often can they expect to hear from you? You know, how are you going to keep the lines of communication open so that, you know, they feel like they're cared for? So one thing that I, we wanted to talk about too is when it comes to connection for any of, any of those of you that have already taught online, the term social presence has been around for a little while, or how do we create social pr presence or make people feel like they are able to build relationships in an online learning format or you know, with, with tech mediated instruction. Um, Ideally, we want the interactions, even if it's an online format, to have some kind of ability to connect, make FaceTime. That's why educational videos are a really strong um, teaching element in online classes. Audio is a big thing, um, which is why you see the pop-up for a lot of technology like Zoom or, or Google Hangouts. Basically, we want to look at how we can increase the social presence or the quality of being there together, like the togetherness, um, even though we may be far away and even though students may be feeling distant or isolated. We wanna to try to reduce that. And one of the things that we can do is we can share stories. We can share humor. At the beginning of the presentation, um, Ashley shared the, the article about, you know, making making bad online classes, right? And so I think that that's important because that article for you, those of you who read it or are going to read it, I think that uses a little bit of humor and humanizing as well. And we really need that to connect with students who may be feeling isolated. So, and you can use humor too, <laughs> um, uh, carefully. Um, so for example, you may have seen this graphic that explains why limiting contact is so important and preventing preventing the impact of this pandemic. And you might even want to send this to students to help explain why your course is going online. But Twitter user Anne-Marie Darling posted that lots of science-y folks are posting this graph, but if there's one thing I have learned from being on the internet, it is this. Data graphs, not compelling to many. Kitties, compelling to many. So I present catening the curve. And she shares a modified graphic that shows the first area of the graph with the label, alert kitty outbreak, will pounce and shred the healthcare system like the arm of your couch. The shorter area of the graph is labeled lazy kitty outbreak, long intervals between transmission events, like the amount of time kitty will hold this position, healthcare systems can cope. So of course we don't suggest that you spend lots of time generating funny memes, but humor can certainly ease the tension we are all feeling and remind students that you are a real person. I think another thing that's really important to keep in mind too, as we look at ways to connect with students, whether it's in face-to-face -face sessions like we're having right now, um, or whether you decide to try to make some learning videos, is I don't think anybody's going to be expecting you to be this perfectly produced educational video like you see in YouTube where they have entire production teams. It's okay to be yourself. It's okay to sometimes make mistakes. Students are going to want to feel comfortable and they're going to want to feel like they're with you. And when we're lecturing in class or when we're standing and doing activities in class, we're not 100% perfect all the time. So I think it's really important to give ourselves some of that grace as well. And another thing, if you're moving to a learning management system or an LMS um, that your school already uses, there, most of them have the ability to create a discussion board. And you can always increase social presence by having spaces in those learning management systems for a virtual cafe or a water cooler, or just a space for people that aren't necessarily associated with an assignment, but are a place to connect and have some of the discussion like students would naturally have in the classroom at the beginning of class before instruction starts. You can, if you don't have a learning management system at your school, you can also still think about things like Google groups or there's social media apps. Some people use Facebook, um, some people use Twitter or what, WhatsApp or Discord. Um, there's a lot of 
tools out there that you could potentially use with students to keep that casual conversation going and keep them connected with each other as well as connected with you. So let's just take a second to see if anybody has any ideas, maybe things that you're already doing or things that you've seen done. Um, and if you have a great idea for connecting and keeping up that social presence, go ahead and drop some of the ideas in chat. I see some people are mentioning that people don't check email as often. I think that's a good point. Yes, I see remind someone messaged. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool because students can um, give you their, their uh, phone number if they'd rather read it, read it, receive a text instead of an email. Um, and that way when you send messages, it goes to their text on their phone instead of their email. Um, so that's a great tool. Um, and a lot of people are sharing some really other great um, tools too, like um, using Zoom or Slack. Um, Peruse all, um, Flipgrid, GroupMe, Microsoft Teams, uh, Bitmojis, those are fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, you can actually create an emoji of yourself. <laughs> so that you, they, they remember what you look like, but it's still fun to have um, your presence in your communications with them. Really quickly too, I noticed that uh, Kristen just mentioned, I think non-required synchronous meetings can be good. Just be sure to make recordings available for those who can't join at the set time. So I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Exactly, with what we're doing right now, we're recording this. Okay, so um, let's talk about the next interconnected element in our oxygen molecule, and that's continuity. I don't know about other folks that are supporting the work of faculty, but um, for me early on, I needed to simplify things because just like for faculty moving into this sort of environment, it is a, um, they need to simplify things. I needed to simplify things and how I support faculty. So what you see now is sort of what I consider to be my continuity plan when I work with faculty. Um, and the first item is to create a home. So instead of it being in your classroom, since that's no longer your hub, what is gonna be your new hub? And that could be your learning management system, you know, uh, Google Classroom, it could be Google Docs, it could be anything, but choosing sort of that hub for your class, how you're gonna share materials and information with students, I think that's the first step. The second step is clarifying your expectations. Um, how should students contact you? When will you respond? Be judicious with that. Because once you respond immediately, the expectation becomes that you're always going to respond immediately. And that may not be um, a viable option for you, you know, for the rest of the semester. Um, what do students need to do right away? Um, what about deadlines? And then how will they get feedback? The next item in this continuity plan is how are you going to communicate? Um, are you going to do regular emails, announcements? Are they going to be sort of at the beginning of the week? What is your plan? Um, I think it's important to rem remember this is a marathon and it's not a sprint. So consider re re reserving some time in your week to take a break from this, but let your students know you're going to be unavailable during those times because we all need that time to recharge. Um, then the next step is um, figure out an approach to organize files that will work for you before you get into the course planning. Um, and you want to give students guidelines for how you want them to also submit their work. So instead of getting, you know, uh, 50 files that say stuff one and stuff two, you know, think about how maybe you want them to name them or the ways in which you want to restrict that they submit them so it's easier for you to manage. Um, realistic time management, I think, is super important. Um, teaching online takes a lot of time, um, and there's a lot to deal with. So consider working for shorter periods of time and take a lot of breaks. 
Um, foster, number six is foster communication. Um, learning online doesn't need to be isolating. Um, I would suggest getting them talking because many of them are pretty accustomed to talking in an online environment and sort of follow their lead, see what works for them. Um, and then last, uh, think about methods for feedback. Feedback can come in a lot of different forms. It can be feedback from you on assignments. It can be feedback from peers and discussions. But I just say, you know, keep all of your options in mind to help you sort of manage this process. So as we start thinking about the care per portion of our oxygen molecule, I think that it's really nice. And I actually just found on one of the Facebook groups that I'm part of um, higher ed and dealing with the, the, the situation is be sure as you're talking to students in their different situations, sometimes they're going to be displaced from their dorms. Um, there's a lot that's going to be going on. So if there's any kind of outlash, whether there's anger or high emotions. And I know this from talking to my students on the last day of class last Thursday, there are tears. There's a lot of emotional stuff and not all of it is just about our, our class, right? So we mentioned that a little bit in the beginning as well. A lot of it is wrapped up in all the other elements that students may have going on. They may be leaving dorms. They may be having to get jobs to afford the apartment their apartments because they're not in the dorms anymore. They may be worried about family members. They may have kids at home where there's going to be distractions in the background. Um, so one of the things that I think that we need to take care of, and this kind of um, pings with some of the synchronous meeting times that I was seeing in chat as well, as we realize and recognize we can care for ourselves and we can also care for our students by realizing that we have to be flexible and nimble, keeping the expectations um, around, okay, there are gonna be circumstances that are going to be different. I'm also going to have some synchronous meeting times with my students. However, I know that they're not going to be the same as being in class. I have to recognize that. Um, and I also have to realize that some of my students that are next to the Canadian border because of where I'm at, geographically don't have great Wi-Fi. I have to be able to give them the option to dial into any synchronous meeting that I have because otherwise they just simply will not be able to connect. So I think one of the easiest um, lessons that I'm taking away and as I support with faculty as well is, okay, so if we think about designing an online class and it takes months to design an online class, that's not what we're doing here, right? We're, we're trying to, to just continue teaching. We're trying to identify what it's going to take for us to continue teaching and set up the, the parameters so that our students can continue to learn, even with the challenges that they may have in their environment. So what kinds of things can we make available to them, even though there might be distraction and there might be things that are preventing them um, to connect in a way that's you know equal with what we're used to. So let's check in again. And if you could type into the chat um, some of the ideas that you have about caring. So um, what are some strategies for caring about yourself and caring about your students? And how can you let them know that you care about them? And that's a tough one. <laughs> Remaining calm. Yes, that's very important. And I don't know if anyone got here early enough to hear the calming purple planet music I was playing um, as we were getting ready to start. And that's something simple that you might do is if you are doing a synchronous session, why not um, start with some calming music? Um, so we've also got some other um, ideas in here too. Um, screen time burnout is a, a great one to be um, aware of. Uh, being open and honest with your students about admitting that stress, um, this, can be, this is a stressful time for everyone. You know, being, being human, humanizing. Um, your, your instruction, being flexible and understanding. Ah, 
Anne Marie had a great idea. She's going to email her students today with something warm and funny and tell them that she'll be thinking about them um, a lot this week as she plans for the rest of the semester. I think that's a super idea. Yeah, I saw that George is saying or mentioned as well that going to message out supports in addition to some of those Maslow lower level supports like food banks and such, which is a great idea. So Ashley, um, can you tell us about what we mean by what's your heart? Sure, Anne. Um, so now we've addressed assessing and making decisions about our oxygen, the key element we need to address in our academic triage. Now let's get to the next area of triage, our heart. What are the essentials for you? Uh, I want you to think about the key objectives and outcomes that you've already that you have not already been able to assess, what must students, must students walk away knowing or being able to be able to do for your class or discipline? What do you want students' big takeaways to be at the end of the semester? Um, so as you think about these um, in, you know, sort of under the umbrella of what's going on, some of the things um, that we've talked about, you know, as we've been planning this is, um, are there ways for us to, um, to switch to maybe more application-based assessments rather than um, sort of traditional exams if one of your concerns is around um, testing and cheating and that sort of thing? Um, might your institution have the option to offer students the opportunity to switch to a pass-fail option um, at sort of this midway point to kind of help again um, help you focus in on the goals of your course, but also maybe alleviate some of students' fears and concerns about how the class is changing. Um, so when you think about how you want students to feel, you might also consider um, maybe modifying some of your policies, things around late penalties or attendance policies if you're going to do synchronous sessions, knowing that some of our students may need to return to work um, because they're not able to work in their on-campus job. Um, so they're going to have different schedules to work around, whatever the circumstances are, and the place in which they're staying, okay? So in our triage model, the final part is um, your mind. So you notice we haven't gotten to instruction yet, and that's on purpose because we want you to carefully think through what, what is most important to you and to your students in this time to help you make some um, decisions before you even start thinking about the actual teaching. So the, in your mind, you'll want to now start thinking through some learning decisions, like what do you want the learning experience to be like for your students? And what do you want your students to be able to do? And some of your instructional decisions. How will you continue to teach? And what will you keep? And what will you change? And what will you just plain get rid of? Because we are going to have to pare down um, what we had planned in our syllabus. And how do you know what they are learning? So um, it, Heather and I developed a, um, a matrix of modalities for you to think through uh, what you could do in various modalities, whether it's face-to-face, -face, um, uh, synchronous online or asynchronous online, based around what your instructional need is. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these, but we have um, in the um, handout, we have a link to the article, um, Keep Calm and Move On, where we've got this matrix here. So for example, if your instructional need was to, ass to um, assess or activate prior knowledge, what you would probably do in your face-to-face -face class and what you might have been doing so far would, would be like an entrance ticket. Ask students to write down what they already know about the topic or have a conversation about what students may know or review earlier content or connections. So if you plan to continue teaching synchronously but at a distance, you could screen share a prompt or a question on Zoom while you wait for students to log in and ask them to think about it or write into the chat. Uh, you can ask about their previous knowledge in the chat. If you were to go asynchronous online, so no uh, timed meetings, then you could create a guiding question or a prompt 
before the content to help students contextualize what they're about to learn or what you're about to present to them. Uh, you can create a checklist or a short video or a text reminder of what was previously covered. Uh, if you want to introduce students to new content, in your classrooms, you've probably lectured. You may have done some presentations or demonstrations um, or whiteboard work or assigned reading. And you can do some of those same kinds of things in a synchronous Zoom option, like right now we're lecturing in Zoom. Uh, we screen shared. Um, in this case, of Google Slides, not a PowerPoint. There is a whiteboard option in Zoom, or you could use a document camera with pen and paper. Um, you could do some readings over Zoom, or if you were doing asynchronous options, uh, you could record some short videos. Uh, we do not recommend recording an entire two and a half hour lecture. Um, no matter how good of a lecture you are, that is painful to sit through. So chunk up your content. Um, and instructional need, uh, formative assessment and checking for understanding. Here are some ideas. I'm just going to quickly go through these so that we have some time to um, take some questions before we wrap up. And um, exchanging ideas, uh, students practicing skills with guidance, and then assessing understanding. Um, so we're not going to be able to assess in the same way that you did before. Um, so these are some things for you to consider. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just meant to get your creative instructional juices flowing. And these are the kinds of things that you can use to ask questions um, of your support staff on campus or um, of other people in um, online and in um, social media. I just posted a direct link to that too for anybody that just wanted to look at that page. Great, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, so as we're sort of, you know, kind of coming to the end of our time um, to sort of start to wrap things up, we want to talk a little bit about resources for support. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw it, um, Amy Young, she's at Pacific Lutheran University. She wrote a piece on Facebook at her institution um, after a training session on moving your classes online. And um, it's now up to, uh, let's see, I just checked it, uh, 5.7 thousand um, shares. Um, and I think she touches on some really important things for us to take into consideration. Um, as you move forward, be kind to yourself and your students. Um, stay in contact with students and stay transparent. Um, I think this is especially important. Talk to them about why you're prioritizing certain things in your course or asking them to read or do certain things as maybe compared to what they were doing, you know, right before this all happened. Um, remember, you will not recreate your classroom and you cannot hold yourself to that standard. It's just not going to happen. If, if I was designing a, my class right now or a class right now to be fully online, I mean, I might take six months to a year to kind of map it out and plan it and, and to work through it. There's not really time for that now. So part, so the next step is to prioritize. What do the students really need to know? And then last, stop reading or don't read anything on best practices for distance learning because this is not the moment for that. Um, we're just in triage mode. Um, none of us were prepared for this. So we, we need to just to take care of ourselves, support one another and keep our students' best interests at heart. So we do have a document um, uh, handout for you that's in Google Docs, and Heather just shared that in the chat, um, and we'll be sending that out with the recording. And it is uh, publicly editable, um, so we wanted to crowdsource some ideas there. Um, and uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I know that people do have to leave and, and wrap up. Um, feel free to go ahead and ask questions in that document um, since we're not going to have time to, to do that here. But we do want to check in with you again about where you are now. So what's one word or feeling, um, if you want to uh, jot that in the chat, that you're feeling right now? And is it any different than what you felt when you first joined us uh, 45 minutes ago? So reassured and determined. Well, that is fabulous grateful, appreciative, thankful, better. I feel fine. Still hopeful. Oh, good. <laughs> we didn't lose that one. <laughs> 
And um, we did model a few things for you today. Um, and uh, these slides we are sharing as well too. Um, so you can uh, look back for evidence of, of what some of those things are because we do believe in connection, continuity, and care. So we wanted to do that in this webinar with you today. And our last thing before we, we wrap up, um, I want to bring it back to our medical model here with Florence Nightingale, the, the mother of nursing. And a nice quote here from her that I think is really appropriate today. How very little can be done under the spirit of fear. Uh, and she also said, so never lose an opportunity of urging a practical beginning, however small, for it is wonderful how often in such matters the mustard seed germinates and roots itself. So what's next for you? What is your practical beginning, no matter how small? What is the thing that you are going to do next? And Patty said she's going to email her students today. And so does Melissa. That's great. And great, Pam says she's going to pare down her topic list. And John says he is going to take a breath. I think that is excellent. Thinking about what's essential, being realistic, contacting students, clarifying priorities. Great. We've got some excellent next steps here. And um, I'm... Uh, do want to quickly pop up here one more um, poll question of your feedback. So how helpful was this webinar? And your choices here are one, you've saved my life, or two, very helpful, three, fairly helpful, four, not so much, or five, what a waste of time. So I hope um, this has been helpful for you and it looks like people are saying that. And we will also, um, pop up our contact information here. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is, yes, a scary time, but um, when we are in this together, amazing things are happening. Thank you, Anne, for organizing us around this. Absolutely, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you.